Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And by Citrix GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Visit gotomeeting.com and click on the Try It Free button and sign up for a 30-day trial. Hey, everybody. This is one of my favorite episodes of all time for this week in startups. I have on the program Elizabeth Irons. She founded a company. She went to Y Combinator, and her company is Science Exchange. And she is a brilliant PhD in cancer research, and she explains the entire world of research and development of new treatments and research papers um, and how she is using Science Exchange to get all of these different labs and lab workers and researchers to work together. It's kind of like Yelp for science. Anyway, this is one of the most fascinating people I've ever met in my life, and she explains so much about the future of science and research and cancer that your mind is going to be blown. She will be back on the program again. Uh, she's brilliant. This, sh- this episode is brilliant. You're going to learn a lot. Uh, stay tuned. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. Gonna live like me, cause until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like me, cause until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and we've been doing this show for 500 episodes, and boy, am I tired. No, this is the most thrilling thing in the world. Think about my job. I angel invest in companies, and then I invite brilliant people on the program to educate me about where the world is going, and the world is changing extremely fast right now. In fact, the pace, the massive pace of change in the world today has never been seen in the history of humanity before. If you took somebody, as somebody wrote like in a really clever blog post I read the other day, if you took somebody in 1750 and you put them in 1550, you put somebody in 1750 into 1950, and then you put somebody in 1950 into 2015, people from those other time periods would actually kind of recognize the world. But if you put somebody from 1950 in the world today, they would have no idea. In fact, if you put somebody from 1980 in the world today, it would be mind-blowing. They wouldn't even know how to exist in the world because they'd never seen a computer. They'd never seen electric cars, all this stuff. The world is changing very quickly, which means there's a ton of opportunity for entrepreneurs to build products and services that change the world and maybe actually even head humanity in the right direction because, let's face it, things are getting complicated out there. The problems we face as humanity, as a civilization, as a planet, I mean, they're extremely complex. The interdependencies of the climate and energy and capitalism and computing, this, all this stuff is becoming intertwined. And one of the biggest, most complex spaces is, of course, in science, biology, and that connection with technology. Big data, uh, you know, just sort of supercomputers, everything is conspiring to take biology and other sciences to, and healthcare to a just a whole nother level. And I actually don't know much about this space. Uh, that's why I'm thrilled to have my guest on today, Elizabeth Irons. Now, you're a PhD in what? Cancer biology. Cancer biology. Where'd you get that PhD from? From the Institute of Cancer Research in London. Ah. Now, what, what drew you to uh, cancer research and going for your PhD in that, I wonder? So my entire career was based around being really interested in biology and interested particularly in biomedical research. And when I was doing my undergraduate degree in biomedical research, I sort of was exposed to a lot of different fields like neuroscience, cancer biology, developmental biology. And at that time, when I went to do my PhD, obviously we had to select one to work in. And I really felt like cancer biology had all of the fundamental pieces in place. And it was right on the verge of being able to make really significant discoveries with the tools that have been built. And so I really wanted to be part of that. And what are those fundamental aspects of cancer that have, in a way, sort of created this perfect storm that would I be correct in saying we might be able to cure cancer or not die of cancer in the near future? Because it feels kind of like that's where it's heading. People don't die when they get cancer as much as they used to certainly or as quickly. That, yeah, so certainly that's true. Um, I always think about curing cancer as sort of very 
audacious statement because cancer is a number or well, hundreds of different individual diseases. And so any single form of cancer is um, sort of a different disease than other ones. They're all fundamentally linked by being caused by genetic mutations that drive uncontrolled proliferation of cells in a specific component of the body. But each of those diseases is driven by different mutations. And so every tumor we're now learning, we have to understand the specific drivers of that tumor. And then we can develop targeted therapies that can actually treat those individual tumors. And so that's things like Herceptin, Gleevec. These are the kind of really exciting discoveries that have been What are those made. two discoveries? I've never heard either of those words. So um, Gleevec. Gleevec. Actually, Gleevec. It Gleevec. actually um, targets a specific fusion mutation in leukemia. Hmm. So um, two genes that are normally separate get fused together in a lot of patients who have um, this form of leukemia and basically it drives uncontrolled proliferation. And because it's being driven just by this one fusion gene that doesn't exist in normal cells, then if you can basically target that fusion, then you can only kill the cancer cells. Ah. So instead of having chemotherapy or any of these drugs that just target proliferation more generally, those have a lot of toxic effects because you end sure. up, you obviously end up killing all cells that proliferate. So you have They're kind of a sledgehammer, aren't they? Yeah. And you have all of these really bad side effects. And so with um, these new therapies that are targeting the things that are only happening in cancer cells, you have a much wider therapeutic index. So hmm. that means that you can really be just killing the cancer cells and your normal cells are okay and so you don't get as sick. And when you go after those specific mutating cells, how are you going after them? Yeah, so it's a really complex process, which is why I feel like a lot of the time with cancer research, people think about this war on cancer that was declared a long time ago and many, many billions of dollars have been spent on the war on cancer without as much progress as we would have liked to see. And I think in some ways that's kind of short-sighted because what, what that time period was spent doing was really understanding the genetic basis of cancer and learning about how we can actually discover those mutations that are targetable. Mm. And then once you discover them, then you have to actually find drugs that will target them and go through the whole human clinical trial process. And then you'll finally, 15 years later, get a drug Got that's it. out and available to patients. So then would I be correct in saying this, whatever it's been, is it a 30-year sort of war on cancer, yes, I think, yeah. about? Because it kind of yeah. happened in the 80s, right? Yeah. How did that start, the war on cancer? Did, like, Nancy Reagan or some specific person champion it the way sort of Eleanor yeah, Roosevelt did, I think, human I think rights? I it was, I mean, this was obviously before my time, yeah. but I think it was the Reagan um, yeah. era that basically said, you know, this is a very, very significant problem, and mm. we're investing not enough of our resources into trying to solve it, and we're yeah. kind of doing the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, we're going to end up with this huge amount of people who are dying of cancer and we're mm. going to have to pay a lot of money to treat them. And really, we should be looking for ways that we can address that better. And and so that all that research is now starting to get to drugs. Yep. And technology has advanced phenomenally in yes. that time period. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think is the single most powerful component um, in this technological revolution um, in helping uh, cure, mitigate cancer? Well, I mean, certainly most people would say the development of next generation sequencing mm -hmm. has been just phenomenally powerful in terms of being able to sequence just vast numbers of tumors mm -hmm. and be able to identify all of the mutations to start to really get at where are the common driver mutations and can we really separate the signal from the noise and, and understand mm -hmm. what these mutations are. Right. Um, so that's obviously been a really key enabling technology. Um, and, and is that like work go back to like George Church and like Craig Ventner and the work they did on sequencing the human genome is that the same? Yeah, sort so of I mean it's not the same track. Yeah, yeah, it's not the same technology and there's been a lot of sort of fundamental shifts in the technology that's used to actually do DNA sequencing, but it all began with actually the NIH who began the very audacious human genome project with more than 200 different researchers taking part in that very large scale effort. And this is this idea of kind of big science which mm. is relatively 
new in the biological space. This has been more commonly kind of pursued in areas like physics, where you can have very commonly 200 different researchers working on a massive project together. Hmm. That hasn't really happened in the past for biology, but that was really the Human Genome Project where that first kind of happened. All right. So uh, when we get back from this commercial break, I want to talk about your project and why you created Science Exchange. And if we're going to cure cancer in our lifetime, and which generation is going to be the beneficiary, which is to say, you know, my parents both are cancer survivors now. I think you and I are probably in the same general generation. You're 25 or 30. <laughs> It's not impolite for me to ask, but when did you get your PhD? Let me ask that. <laughs> um, I finished my PhD in 2008. Okay. So you were 25 at that time, or did you finish it when you were 16 years old? Um, I, I guess I was, yeah, probably 26, yeah. Okay. So you're uh, 31 or something. So we're probably in that sort of same generation of mm -hmm. people. Is it, Are we going to actually experience this, or is it going to be the next generation? But don't answer it, because that's like the teaser for when we get back from this break. Ah, uh, yes, Scott Walker is a great friend of mine, and he runs the Walker Corporate Law Group, which is an amazing group of attorneys who left those big, huge firms to focus on one thing, founders and their startups, and making sure they're protected and that they're nurtured. Because one of the things that kills startups is huge legal bills, huge legal mistakes. You can't afford to pay huge fees to lawyers if you've got a little tiny angel-invested company. You have to be conserving that cash. But in order to be a bigger company and raise those A rounds and raise those B rounds, you're going to need to have your ducks in a row. You need to have perfect documentation of your investments and your IP, et cetera. That's where Scott comes in. He gives flat rate pricing. Yes, fixed fees. He'll tell you. This will cost two grand. This will cost five. This will cost $500. This way, you know what you're going to wind up spending. And all their lawyers have decades of experience. You're not going to get any junior associates working on your account. And you can call my friend Scott Walker at 415 979 9998. 979 9998. Or you can email him, Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Or you can visit walkercorporatelaw.com. He's a total mensch, and you can follow him on at uh, at Scott Ed Walker. you got to put the Ed in there. Scott Ed Walker. And he actually tweets a bunch, and he interacts with entrepreneurs, gives advice, and he quotes all kinds of interesting videos and uh, will point you to great content on Twitter. So I highly recommend following at Scott Ed Walker of the Walker Corporate Law Group. He's a great attorney, good friend, and he's been sponsoring this program for years. Um, you couldn't do better than Scott Walker helping you with your legal issues for your startup. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Elizabeth Irons is my guest today, and she's Elizabeth I-O-R-N-S. Um, so Irons spelled wrong. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I-O-R-N-S uh, on the Twitter, so you can follow her. Do you tweet a lot? Um, I tweet sometimes. I'm not super prolific, but... Right, so is your big PhD in uh, cancer tweet, uh, like, uh, group? Do you all tweeting to each other regularly about cancer? There, and... um, there actually is a really active science community on Twitter. It's yeah. really interesting. It's, um, it's one of the few social media channels that I do think a lot of scientists do interact on. See, that is fascinating. I that as, like, a throwaway question, but it's actually yeah. fascinating that Twitter... So have you met scientists you didn't know before and built relationships with them on Twitter? Yes. Okay, Actually, now that's I kind have. of fascinating when you think about <laughs> it. Because everybody it's... dismisses Twitter. Yeah. And I always tell people the smartest people in the world spend a lot of time on Twitter, basically daily. Yeah. And they're making connections with other like-minded people. Um, but we were talking before the break about the sort of big uh, collaboration mm -hmm. uh, of people on the Human Genome Project and physics um, and also our, who's going to benefit from all this research. Um, so who is going to benefit? Uh, are we going to not die of cancer or are half of our people in our cohort not going to die of cancer? <laughs> you know, the same way our parents basically made it past 60, I think, in most cases. And, and the previous generation seemed to die at 50 or 60 of cancer. Now they're making it to 80. Are we going to make it to 100 and not die of cancer? Well, I think there's still going to be a lot of people that get, get cancer, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them will die. But certainly all of the drugs that are starting to come to market now are going to be very important for helping people survive longer with cancer. Mm. Um, I mean, the field I was in, breast cancer, is actually now really 
relatively survivable. So 95% of women who get breast cancer and it's still confined to the breast will live more than five years. So that's actually, you know, really amazing statistic. It's amazing. My mom is a 15 year, 15 yeah. year survivor. Yeah. Thank God. I'm so glad my mom's still around. Uh, my dad now is a prostate cancer survivor for five years. Yeah. Um, and it seems like if you catch it early detection, mm -hmm. the eradication through hormones and uh, surgery and uh, chemotherapy seem to be working well. What, what's next? Are people taking pills now or that will actually, you know, pause this mutation that occurs? Is that actually happening? And would a vaccine be possible? Or is that the right term to even use? Yeah, that's really, I mean, these are really interesting questions. Um, so there definitely are targeted therapies now that are on the market, which mm. do treat specific mutations. Um, in breast cancer, actually one of the first targeted targeted drugs, even though it wasn't really thought about it like that, was actually hormone therapies. Mm. So um, there's aberrant signaling of estrogen receptor in about two thirds of breast cancer. Mm. And that's a key driver of breast cancer in those patients. And so even before we sort of had the term targeted therapy, we developed hormone therapies like tamoxifen and then later on um, different, more advanced hormone therapies that block that signaling. And mm. then those have been very effective in breast cancer. Uh, what is the relationship between hormones and, and cancer? Because it seems like hormone therapy, my, my father actually uh, mm -hmm. went through it as well for prostate cancer. His PSA went from very high down to like 0. 0.0 something. I mean, yep. they were basically telling me, say goodbye to dad. And then they were telling me like, um, you know, just forget he had prostate cancer. We're going to check it every year. But, <laughs> you know, his PSA is flat. I mean, it's like yeah. a little bit terror. I have to say it was a little bit terrorizing in that the doctors were so wrong um, about the prognosis, and it flipped so dramatically. I mean, delightfully so in this case. Um, but what, what is that relationship with hormones? How do we discover it? And, and is is that going to be the path, or is it going to be this sort of which is yeah, going to be the path? Those yeah. are actually you know old treatments that have been known for more than twenty years, um, and so where we're developing new drugs against hormone targets, they're just kind of um, iterating on the, the drugs mm. that are already there. And then the kind of different approach is to actually use our genetic knowledge about mm. these mutations to target specific mutations as well. So um, these are things like, like I mentioned, Gleevec and also Herceptin in breast cancer. So Herceptin mm. targets the specific amplification of ah. the HER2 gene, which only happens in about 25% of breast cancers. But those patients now have the ability to use a monoclonal antibody that prevents signaling hmm. and that's been very effective in breast cancer as well. So if it, when you say prevents signaling, it never triggers these um, cells to mutate? So the cells are already mutated. So oh, cancer, already mutated. yeah, cancer is always driven yeah. by genetic mutations. Right. But what's happening is those ge genetic mutations drive aberrant signaling pathways that promote mm. proliferation. Got it. And so what you're trying to do is block whatever signaling pathway is promoting the proliferation. You're basically containing it. Yeah. yeah. Ah, so that's or amazing. trying to help actually even kill the cells if they're reliant on it for survival. So tell me about like something like 23andMe and getting mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, so um, interesting. Um, what are you doing when you actually put your saliva in there? What are you getting back? And, and yeah. is this in any way helpful today or is it just a novelty today? I think mind. it's actually helpful today. So okay, 23andMe is super powerful, and I think at the beginning people thought of it a little bit as a novelty, but I think they've really shown that it's way more than a novelty. Mm -hmm. So they obviously just released their partnership with Genentech, mm -hmm. and so they're you know they're legitimately working with one of the most powerful biofarmers in the world to really understand the genetic SNPs involved with different character characterization of their patient populations that they're treating with their drugs. So for sure this is, you know, very real partnership. And so people spit into a bunch of and take swabs mm -hmm. and they give their DNA, it gets sequenced. Yeah, it's, so they're not doing sequencing. What okay. they actually do is a technology that looks at specific, um, what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Mm. 
these um, are actually in everybody's DNA. We're slightly different from each other. Uh-huh, so sure. these aren't mutations. They're just that if I compare across my genome to anybody else, there'll be slightly different versions ah. of so the So looking gene. at the deltas, the differences. Yeah. Yep, looking for the differences and trying to say, are these differences associated with any mm. um, phenotypic changes? So they've done some really kind of... What does that mean, what, phenotypic? So phenotypic is like the, what is displayed as um, your hair color or ah, okay, your okay. eye color. Um, and so they've done some really what people think of as kind of novelty sort of associations like motion sickness. They just released one um, where they found SNPs that were associated with people who are more likely ah, to get motion sickness. That's me. But how cool is that? Because that it's really engages cool. the public. It says the public is like, this is really cool. Like they see science going on inside the mm. universities and they're like, they really, I feel like a lot of the time the public is very disconnected from that and they often yeah. feel like their questions are not really being answered. It really does pull you in when you can mm-hmm. get those those kind of pieces and of And you're like, oh, and I can go and look at what my genotype is for that particular They made it personal yeah. and that's absolutely fantastic, Yeah, um, I think, for people to draw them in. In fact... There was a interesting thing that happened because it also tells you your lineage, right? Like yeah, where, you can look where your ancestors came from. It's yeah, really cool. and um, you know there was like uh, some splaining to do. Actually, <laughs> I have a case which let me just scrub it a little bit here. I'm <laughs> mentally going through, and I'm going to change some of the uh, statistics uh, or some of the the profiles. Anyway, put it this way: somebody had their um, somebody you know did 23 of me. It came back that they weren't 100 percent from this country in Asia. Mm-hmm. They were kind of like 20% from this other country. Oh, really? So they went to mom and dad and said, hey, you know, I, I did this, and I thought we were 100% from this country. And they were like, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, your great-grandmother uh, actually kind of had an affair with somebody from this country, and then that's where, <laughs> like, your great-uncle, grandfather came from, and then that's how you have that. And they're like, oh, okay. How, how did that wind up? Uh, never mind. You know, like, it was like one of those, like, never mind, we don't want to really go too deep into yeah, exactly what so. happened. But it, it it actually turns out that some percentage of people are not the sons and daughters of sure. who they thought they were. Yeah. And this actually brings it out. Yeah, of course. Unintended consequences, I yeah. guess. And I don't know what liability they have. Do they do something where they tell you, like, hey, be careful for what we're about to tell you? I um, wonder. They do for some of the health-related findings, which at some point they were actually forced to remove from their oh, website. Yes. So the I'm FDA not sure. came yeah. down like a ton of bricks on them mm-hmm. because like a lot of... Silicon Valley companies, they kind of just went for it, yeah. it seems. And they were like, yeah, FDA, well, you know, when you catch up, you can catch up. But that actually didn't, strategy didn't work too well. What mm-hmm. happened there? I'm not super familiar with yeah. that. But I think what the FDA's take on it was that what they were providing was medically actionable information, which is right. actually regulated. Sure. So um, you can't provide that type of information without a clinician providing mm. it to the patient to help explain the information. Right. So you have Parkinson's markers. You need to have yeah. a doctor now say you yeah. have kind of ridiculous. It's like, kind of God. paternalistic, yeah. It's it very is paternalistic. paternalistic. Like, yeah, the, the state knows better than you or we have to, yeah. All right, when we get back from this break, I want to talk about very specifically um, Science Exchange, which is your company, mm-hmm. uh, what you built and why when we get back from these important messages. Ah, uh, yes, Citrix go-to meeting. I use it every day, multiple times a day. And you know what? The weather's been horrible. Roads are closing. People are sick. This happens. We're having a terrible winter. God, the poor people out east. And even here in San Francisco and Los Angeles, torrential downpourings. And you know what? Sometimes people miss meetings. But we're always near a high-speed, beautiful internet connection. And you can connect to GoToMeeting on any device and have a perfect, flawless meeting. I do these meetings all day long. I did a meeting over GoToMeeting with Glenn Beck the other day in preparation of the launch festival. That's a famous guy. And we had perfect fidelity. It was like we were in the same room. Perfect video, like we are in the same room. It was perfect and flawless. And you can share your screen perfectly and flawlessly. And you can do that on your iPad, on your Android device, and they do HD video conferencing. So if you're really into that like high-end HD video conferencing, don't use the standard camera that comes with your iMac or your MacBook Pro. Buy the Logitech 1080p like we use, and you will have these amazing meetings with perfect, perfect, gorgeous video. Um, go ahead and go to gotomeeting.com and try it for 30 days. You've got nothing to lose, obviously. So you can visit gotomeeting.com, click the Try It Free button, and you will get uh, the first 30 days free in the trial. It's an amazing product. We use it all the time. 
and it's super simple to use, flawless. It's actually got a little chat room, and you can record the uh, meetings as well. Those two features are underrated as well. I'm like, hey, get in the chat room. Hey, we're going to record this, so if somebody missed it, they can listen in, or we can go back and make bullet points out of it if you're the product manager and we're on a call discussing product. Boom, we record it. Um, and we'll record them sometimes for the launch festival, so we'll record them so we can play back to the person who's going to demo what they sounded like, and they can see themselves and be like, oh, hey, this is what I sound like. Anyway, it's a great product. Thank you to my friends at Citrus. Citrix at GoToMeeting. You can follow at Citrix and at GoToMeeting on Twitter. All right. Great job, Citrix, for GoToMeeting. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I am with the clearly very brilliant Elizabeth Irons um, from Science Exchange. And you're also a partner, a part-time partner at Y Combinator. Yep. That's you right. went to Y Combinator. I did, yeah. Um, and I guess most people don't think of Y Combinator as, um, you know, they think of it as like, apps and enterprise software mm-hmm. and Airbnb and Dropbox. Yep. You came in 2011. Mm-hmm. Is that when you were in the class? That's right, yeah. And they weren't actually known for having a lot of female founders. That's changed <laughs> That's radically. That's changed a lot, they yeah. Fixed, I think they, they fixed it, right? Yeah. Do you think so? I think it's a reflection of just more female entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but they're attracting more, too, because mm-hmm. it does seem like they're really going out of their way to make sure people know, hey, we want more female founders, right? Because they did a female founders uh, yep. event. Yep. Um, but you were drawn to the program in 2011, even when it maybe didn't have as high as percentage of females. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. What, what drew you to join that? Um, How did you find out about it? Because were you in London <laughs> at the time, doing your PhD? I was actually an assistant professor at the University of Miami. So oh. yeah, so From London Miami, to Miami. Yeah, very different. Yeah, that's a that's a rough yeah. change, I bet, huh? Well, very it difficult was, on the it weather. Was, it was rough. <laughs> in in a funny way. So actually, it was my experience of going from London, yeah. from a research institute, to Miami, to a kind of medical school mm. that actually inspired the idea for science exchange. So ah. very, it was very, it was actually very different and quite difficult transition to make. So oh, when from I, London. Yeah. So when I did How my so? when I did my PhD yeah. in London, it's a research institute, which means there's no undergraduates. It's all research. Okay. And it's all smart it's, people. It's very serious, smart people. It's very serious. It's very um, well connected in terms of having the facilities and resources that you need to get your research done. And as an example, when I was there, I did my PhD in just over three years. And in that time, we went from the cell biology experiments to developing a drug that went into a clinical trial. And that is phenomenally quick. Usually it takes like 15 years. And so just by connecting all of the right people, we had uh, mouse experts so that we could run all of the animal studies. We had had um, chemical hmm. chemists who could design the drugs. We had um, a hospital right next door that could do the actual clinical trials with the patients. So all of these different people that have to be highly specialized and come together and work on a project to move it forward were all there and were all kind of aligned in being able to work on these collaborative projects together. Hmm. And that's sort of the idea of how do you get this sort of big science approach where you have multiple different groups working well together to solve really complex problems. Um, then I went to Miami and it was really different. So it was. Uh, for Americans as well. When we go to Miami, <laughs> we feel exactly the same way. It's pretty different it's down pretty there. Different. Yeah. Um, so there it was very individualistic. So, and I think this is true actually of most. Um, medical schools and research mm. facilities in um, in the United States is that there's basically principal investigators that are very well funded and their labs um, kind of all are working as individuals mm. rather than as a kind of cohesive group. Got it. And so when I first started, it took me almost nine months just to get the approvals in place to even collect clinical samples or to do any of the experiments in our lab. Mm. In comparison, in nine months in my PhD, I had screened the entire genome looking for genes that regulated resistance to tamoxifen. Hmm. So a very different pace at which you could do research. That's fascinating because, you know, we have this bias here in America that we think we have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. But academia here in America doesn't seem to have it all figured out, and and nor does it seem that we have our medical research uh, super efficient. Am I correct in thinking that? It's it's definitely not um, optimally efficient, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So then basically this was this kind of idea that you have increased specialization, more and more researchers actually becoming very highly specialized in different techniques and it becomes very expensive for a researcher to actually learn every single technique, both in terms of time but also to actually stock up their lab with Mm -hmm. the instrumentation Um, and so they have to sort of find 
each other and form these bartering relationships where they're like, can you do this part of my project for me and I'll do it your favour in the future? And of course that's extremely inefficient. So it was basically seeing how slow this process could be that made me want to create a marketplace where you could just simplify collaboration hmm. to ordering an experiment from the world's best labs. Got it. And here it is. I have it on the site. So if you go to scienceexchange.com, you have the .com, yeah. Um, and I see here experimental services, geophysical methods, equipment, imaging, um, material methods. So if you need to get something done, yep. you can just click on here and other academic sources or are these professional sources? So the, yeah, these are basically 900 or now more than 900 verified and screened labs from academic mm. institutions, um, also government facilities and uh, pr like basically commercial research institutes. Hmm. So these allow you to go onto Science Exchange and in one place you can search for whatever experiment you need conducted and order it from whichever lab is most appropriate. And uh, these are really some of the top labs like Harvard and Johns Hopkins and places like that. And this has never been organized in this fashion before. Nope. It was just like you had to get on the phone or get on some Usenet group or email people to find it? <laughs> yeah, well, it was a lot of just going to conferences and uh -huh. setting up your relationships with all of your, what's called your collaboration sort hmm. of network where you find your group of friends that you always work with. Got it. And do the other universities like to provide this? University of Utah here is doing mutation generation and detection facilities. 100% positive reviews, 10 words complete. I feel like I'm reading Yelp. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, actually, that's an important part is the review process. So mm. um, historically, it's been really difficult to find out information about how how much it would cost to do a particular experiment uh -huh. and what that person would be like at doing that experiment. And so we're trying to capture that information through the marketplace mm. and sort of provide that so people can make better decisions about who to work with. And for a university, this is income or yep. it defers cost. Yeah, so they're able to, if you think about the funding environment, particularly for academic labs, it's yeah. extremely difficult. Um, effectively, there's been pay cuts every year in terms of the actual spend that the mm. NIH has. And so what we're doing is providing a new way to bring revenue to these labs, and they can then use that revenue to do their own research. Uh, that's super brilliant. And I can see here I can get a zebrafish genome editing um, by Talon. So that <laughs> I was actually looking for that today, and I was like, wow, I can't find this on Yelp. But for eleven twenty-five, seems like a pretty good deal to me. Yeah, um, I think there's some um, there's some really cool examples. Like one example that we always love is. Um, there was a very expensive piece of instrumentation that was launched from Illumina at the beginning of last year called huh. the Illumina High Seek X10. This was oh, the, the High Seek X10. Yeah, this of was course. the I one. Have, yeah, I've been trying yeah. to get on one for a while. This, is a, <laughs> this, is, um, this was a major breakthrough. It was the first instrument that could sequence a whole genome for less than a thousand dollars. And um, but there was only three in the world. So these were each instrument cost more than ten million dollars. Wow. So you can imagine that for labs, this is just. Prohibit and what's it called? Expensive. High sequence? I'm going to search for it while you're doing that. Yeah, if you search for it, um, it's at the Kinghorn Institute in... Um, Kinghorn, okay. Yeah. King space H-O-R-N. Or one word, Kinghorn. It's one word, yeah. Kinghorn, okay. <laughs> Um, and so we got the one that was in Australia available within a week of launch. And that one um, was available to all researchers around the world so that they could have huh. their genome sequence The Illumina for NGS. Very reasonable price, and what was great was that the Kinghorn Center was able to monetize that investment much more quickly than if they had of um, just been using, having doing their own research with that machine. That is so brilliant. So it's in a way, it's like what Perot did with supercomputers. Uh, or mainframes, they did yeah. time sharing on mainframes yep. or something. It's like that. very like that, yeah. Yeah, so pe more people can afford it, more people can use it. Exactly, um, it's distributing access to these cutting edge technologies across the entire research community. And um, so, you, how long has this been in the market, and, and how is it done in terms of um, number of users and mm -hmm. stuff like that? Yeah. Science Exchange or that yeah. specific machine? No, the Science Exchange, yeah. So Science Exchange, we launched in the middle of 2011, and at the time it was definitely a minimal viable product, so it's evolved a lot since then. Yeah. Um, and we have now more than 10,000 researchers that have used the platform. We've Last year we conducted 3,000 projects with wow. about $25 million in quotes submitted through the platform. 
platform. Wow. So, um, so some percentage of those quotes actually made it through yeah. to actually being done. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's right. And yeah. so you're definitely a Y Combinator company. They know exactly how to use those <laughs> metrics. Yeah, I, I know how to decode Y Combinator <laughs> speak very clearly. They always know how to work the metric just a little bit. So, um, so we're actually really excited because um, we've spent, I think, a relatively long time kind of really establishing a very high in supply side of the market. So we truly sure. believe we now have the best labs in the world available through our platform and that that curation of those labs and the effort we put in is going to really pay off. So we um, last year developed three pilots with three large pharmaceutical companies hmm. and we're really looking forward to how we can actually leverage those as full partnerships this year. Ah, so the pharma companies, they must be feeling it too because it's taking longer and longer, isn't yep. it, for them to find drugs? That's right. So for pharma companies in particular, they already saw a while ago that it was going to be much more efficient for them to outsource their research to expert labs rather than do everything mm. in-house. And so they have now, there's about $27 billion that's spent on outsourced research each year just in the preclinical research space. So these wow. are the type of labs that we have available. And so the idea is that there's huge fragmentation in that space and we can basically provide a marketplace that aggregates that fragmented supply side and make it really easy for them to work with them. Yeah. It's like you're the Airbnb and, mm -hmm. or the Uber. And you are you inducing more research because of the availability and the lower costs? I think at, at scale, what we really do is provide the ability to do more research because you can actually do more research per dollar spent. Mm. If you are not spending time and money setting up all of these assays in labs that only use them once mm. and instead use the assay that's already established, everyone uses that one center of excellence, then you get a lot more efficiency. Yeah. And what do the people who make all this equipment think of it? Because they're in the business of selling the $10 million yep. machine. Are they stoked that you've, you know, <laughs> basically said, don't buy a $10 million machine. Don't buy the $100,000 machine. You can just share it. You can just time splice it. You know, like car companies are not exactly thrilled about Uber. So what I actually think is that instrument um, suppliers understand that for the most part, there are only certain labs that will buy that instrumentation, and mm. those labs will still buy that instrumentation. And this is a tool to actually sell it if they're on the edge, because they can say to them, you know, you're worried about making that investment, but you can actually monetize that investment more effectively if you list on something like Science Exchange and get external researchers to pay to use that machine. So that's kind of a tool to help sell. And also a lot of these instrument makers actually make a lot of money off consumables that are used on the instruments. Ah, so kind of the razor, the razor, razor blade, blade kind model. Of situation, yeah. yeah, that's actually a big part of how these instrument um, makers make money. And so for them, they want it operating at capacity. So this is an effective way to promote that. Um, let's talk about the next seismic leap in all of this, because mm -hmm. I understand the enabling technology that Science Exchange is um, providing. That's going to hopefully enable people to go a little bit faster, a little bit yep. cheaper. It seems like collaboration amongst larger groups of people mm -hmm. is the next big thing, as well as uh, artificial intelligence, and maybe there's some other things that you know that I don't. What, what are, in the next 10, 20 years, what are the sort of big jumps going to be, mm -hmm. do you think, and where will they take us? Well, yeah, that's definitely a big question. And I still would like you to tell me when cancer will be cured. I would like a specific <laughs> date, by the way. Um, um, yeah, I think with um, what we're aiming to do with Science Exchange is really facilitate um, researchers to be able to access that cutting edge technology very early yeah. um, so that everyone can do these experiments and it's not just the people who are at Harvard or the people who are at Yale. And actually one of the examples that um, we have on our blog is pretty interesting. So one, one example is a high school researcher who had a theory about what caused um, aging and yeast. She wanted to mm -hmm. look at um, whether or not if she stressed out the yeast a little bit, uh -huh. that made them age faster or slower. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of an interesting experiment she wanted to do. But of course, it's very difficult for a high school researcher to test any kind of real experiments because they don't have access to the equipment. Right. And so she had actually gone around all of the local labs and she couldn't get into the labs because of um, issues with health and safety regulations. Huh. And so she used Science Exchange and she actually discovered a pretty interesting protein that was um, associated with slightly inducing stress that helped these um, cells live longer. Huh. So really interesting discovery and she won her state science fair with that project. Wow. Yeah. It is interesting that young people are now uh, getting involved in basically mm -hmm. biology and yeah. research at this yeah. level. Yeah. Um, and some of it is actually 
material or just interesting? So I think some of it is material, but more importantly, I think it's much bigger than just the fact that young people can enter into it. Because if you think about all of the amazingly smart people in the world, like when I went to Y Combinator and I was, you know, a biologist, had really yeah. not much exposure to the sort of hacker world of yeah. um, Y Combinator. And when I went there, I met all of these amazing, young, smart people. And they were all building, you know, companies in, in interesting spaces, but none of them were working on science. Mm. And they really had no interest in going into a lab and spending in the US seven years on average to actually get a PhD so that they could have the yeah. chance to do that research. And instead, I thought, wow, what if we just said, use your mind and design experiments right. and get these really amazingly smart people to think about these big oh, problems that's fascinating. and outsource the actual hands-on work, right? Wow, that's so fascinating. So you don't need so you to be in the lab. somebody who might think orthogonally or differently yeah. or just yeah. in a way that seven years getting your PhD might preclude you from thinking. Yes, maybe. Because yeah. you're on some set of rails that mm -hmm. puts you down a, a certain path. That's right. Ah, and in some ways that kind of timeline is, um, I saw this really interesting graph where they had plotted the average age of funding um, versus the amount of funding. So it was kind of age versus funding on the scale of um, VCs, mm -hmm. so entrepreneur funding versus um, scientists in the yeah. in the academic research world. And it was like this. Yeah, big negative correlation, and right? And you're like, yeah. that's so sad. The younger you are, the less money you get. Oh, you average, have a lot of energy and interesting yeah. ideas? Nothing for you. Nothing for you. And so the yeah. average age of, of researchers now getting their first independent grant is 42. 42. Yeah. Right when you're ready to plan your retirement and yeah. give up and you've got kids. So there's just, more people now yeah. who actually ha are funded by the NIH who are over 70 <laughs> than who are under 30. That's insane. That's crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, not that age doesn't bring wisdom and we shouldn't fund those people, but there has to be an end as well. Yeah. And I think the energy and the folly of youth, not knowing what you're actually mm -hmm. about to tackle, that's sort of, you know... Yeah, well, there's just, all these amazing ideas that you just want people to be able to test and have the yeah. opportunity to test. And, you know, there's always been this correlation with Nobel Prize winners to actually doing their work, usually in their late 20s, early 30s, being that kind of peak ah. product productivity and, and creativeness mm. that then goes on to win them the Nobel Prize many, many years later. But right. um, you're, you're basically saying that historically that data, we're sort of not finding those people anymore. Is there going to be some exponential growth, though, in discoveries and experimentation? And we sort of touched on it a little bit earlier. Like, are we going to see some catalyst that makes, you know, this type of science sort of go faster? Because it does seem like it's on a certain trajectory. Yeah. And whereas if you look at entrepreneurship and just the internet and technology or hardware and mobile and all that stuff, it's, you know, well, we've, we've kind of got an interesting curve. Is that curve I think exists? you have that curve. And so science actually is really interesting because you have a curve of, first of all, just the amount of knowledge that's being produced. Oh. There's more scientists actually now alive and working in the lab than there has been in the entire, obviously, history combined. Wow. And so it's just a hugely productive time period. There's a lot of scientists out in the world and doing their research. And so you see this with publications, if you look at the number of publications, it is rising exponentially. And so people huh. kind of talk about that really it's become a discovery problem. So it's not that the research probably hasn't been done, it's that we can't find it. Oh, wow. And so all of these publications historically have been published in a very old format, PDF format. Right. There's no data associated and with And they're them. owned by those publications and they don't let them put it out. Yep, they're behind this a paywall. paywall is bold. It is bullshit. So they basically... It is bullshit. No, it's, it's been... What is it? Academia is the company that's trying to make it? Is it Academia is the company so that's trying to make it free? Yeah, there's like a number. And so actually there's been a mandate the um, that's been released by the government. It's the open yes. access mandate. And so within 12 months of publishing, you must make a publicly available version. Right. So that's... Yeah. If, that's if really the government important. is funding it, mm -hmm. these science publishing journals, which have been locking it up... Yep are going to have to make it public. It's so great that the yeah, government is doing it. it's so it. great they've done that. Yeah, because it was holding people back. You'd have to pay for access. Can you imagine anything as insane as locking up the things that may, might make the world better mm -hmm. behind a paywall? I mean, yeah, if you want to put, like, Game of Thrones behind a paywall, fine. 
But cancer research behind a paywall, you crazy? But also because it's all been funded by the taxpayer for the large part anyway. So basically you had, you know, NIH-funded research that then was published in these journals and behind a paywall. By Not these, available to anybody. Which was being done yeah. by commercial Crazy. entities yeah. who were, who are those publishers? What are those kind of like? So Nature Publishing Group, um, yeah. Elsevier. Elsevier, um, yeah. Springer. So yeah, you know, hey, listen, all you publishing companies, like, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to like, I, I, listen, I understand you have a business to run, but. Very successful business as well. <laughs> ridiculous, but too successful. Give yeah. that information back. I mean, the people at Elsevier, you, you, you people, there's a message to the people at Elsevier. You're all gonna die soon. You're all old fogey stogies anyway. Put the information out because you, you, there's some chance you might live ten years long longer, and you probably have kids. Stop being so goddamn greedy. <laughs> it is a greed issue. The short—I mean, when you think about short-term incentives, yeah. the short-term incentive of those publishing companies. I, I get irate about this. I'm just furious because their short-term incentive is to hit their quarter, mm -hmm. to lock up the research that we all paid for. And by the way, they're. All these old fogey stogies who are going to be dead soon, who if that was released, they might be a little more fluidity in research. So there's a lot of projects um, to try and provide access to those research mm. studies, but also to mine those research studies. Yeah, that's so thinking part. about enabling technology and how you could really start to build sort of a really intelligent connection between mm. all of these data points and these papers and really start to get it, oh, this discovery has been shown in actually hundreds of papers, and so we probably believe that that's correct versus this finding has been contradicted, you know, it's only 70 percent of the time. Mm. There, and then since there is no central database, there, there are no central curators. Nope. See, this would be a great thing to um, give a grant for, yeah. is people to there's consolidate people research. On, yeah, there's people yeah. working on it. And then all you get paid for is read all this stuff and think about possible associations and get those people to meet each other. Like they just should have like a social secretary who just reads all this stuff and says, <laughs> you 10 people should have dinner. Right, that so, doesn't occur, does it? Well, I mean, researchers are actually really connected. So you do uh, a lot. So conferences are a very key part of your life as an academic, mm -hmm. where you basically do go and talk to people about your work and right. figure out who you can work with. But in your vertical, mm -hmm. right? Like, you do they have that cross pollinization where the cancer people are talking to the Not whatever as much, people? Yeah. You know? um, but interestingly, one of the things Twenty Three and Me did mm -hmm. was ha they actually hired a team of PhD level curators huh. who will read the literature and find potential genetic associations. Ah. and then validate those associations in their data sets. So they kind of did what you said. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, it's going to take a private company to do it. But the really interesting thing about 23andMe is when they asked, I think it was cystic fibrosis, um, when they asked all the people who were had that in their families mm -hmm. and whatever um, to um, sequence themselves, they all, like 100% of them said, I'll give all of my data and all of my life data to you guys mm -hmm. to then go do studies on. I mean, that's never happened in the history of humanity to find all those markers and then give all that data. What's the impact of big data going to be on all this? If we could record a person's entire life in terms of what's happening in their blood you know, yeah. and all this stuff, what is that going to be like if you had a real-time feed of 10,000 people with markers for Parkinson over you know, 50 years of their mm -hmm. life and you could just look at that data? Do we even know what we'll find? Well, I think there's a lot of evidence that we will find really important things. Yeah. So um, there's actually a project, I've forgotten what it's called, um, but what they're looking for is basically, oh, it's a resilience project. Mm -hmm. And so that project is looking to find mutations that um, protect somebody from developing a disease that they seemed genetically predisposed to. So imagine that there's families out in the world where everyone in their family got early onset Alzheimer's and there's, you know, it, they've got a mutation in a gene that yep. makes them like, you're pretty much sure you're going to get early onset Alzheimer's. But there'll be like a few people in that family that do not get it. And then you're like, what do they have that protected right. them? Now you can check that delta. Super interesting yeah. because that's actually like a way to find, oh, okay, so we understand that this is what goes wrong in these people that had early onset Alzheimer's. And now we can find that if we targeted the other mutation, we might be able to protect them. Yeah, which is basically what happened in 28 Weeks Later. It's basically every zombie film <laughs> we've ever seen is like somebody becomes like a half yes. zombie and they're not dead, but, but they're they got not bit. Dead. Yeah. And it's like, well, how come you're not a zombie exactly? Yeah. 
study. Is. Let's it study does. what's going on with you. I mean, it basically is like science fiction. It basically fiction. is that. Yeah. When are we going to be able to take a pill and like change our eye color? That's another <laughs> one I'm kind of like hot on. Like change your hairstyle mm. or whatever because that's been in all the science fiction. I kind of want that one. So science fiction, I always feel like is sometimes just freakily accurate about what happens. Yeah. You know, it is It is actually very predictive a lot of the time. Yeah, so, so you have a favorite uh, film that is... Uh, no, but I mean, I, I think that the hair color and eye color question is, yeah. um, is you know, is if you think about hair, is not a living organism, so yeah. that's going to be very hard to change unless you wait for it to, like, grow all the way yeah. up. But. Yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like the pace that we're on right now, the abil- the more likely something was in science fiction in the last 30 years is kind of correlates with the likelihood that it's actually going to exist in the real world in the next 30 years, mm-hmm. right? Like if we grew up with it in science fiction, with the exception of probably time travel, like artificial intelligence is kind of getting there right now. What do you think of that whole debate? And I'm not super up with yeah. artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, I feel like we have discussions about it sometimes at Y Combinator and it freaks me out a little bit. Um, yeah. Where we Have you heard this sort of argument of in the future there'll be um, – artificial intelligence that's, you know, like ruling the world. And it will sort of look back and say, you could have done things that helped me become, you know, as intelligent as possible and you didn't. And so Mm. there could be like basically implications for not helping um, promote artificial intelligence to be as successful as it can be now. Yeah, they, they're going to resent us. They're going to resent us. They're going to be like, yeah, really? Be like, you could you have just put more memory. I could have had more storage space. You could have had a faster connection, all mm-hmm. of this stuff. So what will success look like for you with this startup, you know, in five yep. years or 10 years? You know, if, if you if you do the work and, and you get there, what will it look like? So success to us, our real mission is to um, basically provide a global marketplace connecting all researchers through a collaboration marketplace. And so what that means is that every researcher will have their certain skill sets Mm. that are available through the marketplace and they will be able to basically exchange their funding very efficiently through the marketplace in order Uh to at any one time be like, this is the best person in the world to do this part of my project and they're available, order it from them. And so Uh that kind of efficiency, connecting everybody together, would be so powerful. And we've even seen some um, early examples where, for example, Nigerian researchers that had um, very unique rock samples but did not have the right kind of scanning electron microscope or any of the analysis tools there, they were able to access some of those tools at US-based labs here and Uh be able to conduct... they just FedEx the Samples, yeah, yeah. That's very common that you ship samples all around the world. In and do order you think it's the right thing? It goes beyond the equipment to actually just the skill set. Like it's definitely the skill set. Yeah. That's hugely important. So it's it's way beyond the equipment. Yeah. So um, you can have a list of equipment, and if you look compare the list of scientists next to that equipment, like that. For me, I'm going to want to work with a specific set of Got those it. scientists. I'm not going to work with the other ones because they'll be experts at whatever particular experiment I'm working on. What do you do when you get bad reviews? Because bad reviews have come in, I'm certain. Yep. And bad reviews in the world of Yelp are like, I had to wait 20 minutes or yep. my food came cold yep. here. I mean, can you ruin a person's career if they don't know how to use their equipment properly? <laughs> how do you handle that when somebody says like, my God, you, the, the sequencing came in late, it was wrong, it was cold. Wow, what do you, yeah. what do, you do there? I don't think that it would ruin someone's career, but we have very careful about um, basically tracking the whole project interaction on the site. Ah. So it's almost like an audit trail of what was agreed upon. And Mm. then um, every time they, uh, we have email integration. So every time they email, it posts an update on the project. So then we can actually, if there is a dispute, and there actually has been very few disputes, but where there is, we've gone and looked through the trail and we've been able to say, all right, this is the information we need to kind of arbitrate this dispute. And I think, you know, we have a team of PhD trained scientists who are able to really assess that data and say, you know what, you actually really did not provide an adequate level of service. And so in that case, we're actually not going to pay for that work. Ah, so you can refund it. So we can refund it. Or come to a settlement. Give them to, give Mm. the research to another lab to do Mm. so that the researcher is happy. It's what a whole bunch of owners of restaurants would wish Yelp had. I think Yelp does have it now when you're upset. Yeah. I think you can reply back basically. Yeah. Because I wrote something 
that I just wasn't happy about something. And now I'm getting a little bit mental about that because I have too many followers. Mm -hmm. So now I feel very concerned if I write something yeah. about a restaurant I don't like. So it kind of sucks when you get a big following because you can't be honest. Yeah. So I'm going to make some sort of fake name for my Yelp again so I can actually write reviews without That's it being idea. for me. <laughs> so I wrote this thing and then like the person's like emailing me, please come back to my restaurant. I was like, I really don't want to come back to your restaurant. It's like so rude. Like you're yeah. rude to my daughter. Like I don't, like if you don't like kids at the restaurant, I guess I wrote something about not liking kids at the restaurant. And the person's like, oh my God, I have kids. I love it. I would like you to come back. And I'm just like, oh, good. <laughs> it's just like so awkward. I'm like, why did I even write the review now? I feel so guilty. It's yeah. like when you give a, an Uber driver a bad review, I feel so guilty now because I'm like, I want to give a bad review because I want them to get better, but I don't want them to get fired. Yeah, that's tricky. So um, one thing I would say, though, is that we we have had very few disputes for I think a very important reason. So that is that mm. these type of interactions happen all the time, like these collaborations all the time in the scientific research world. And this is very, and science is very messy. Like a lot of the time you'll do an experiment with somebody and it won't work. Mm. And not because the person did something wrong, but it's just. Because most things don't work. That's just science. Yeah. And so um, science I actually is think a bummer. <laughs> pe people actually have different expectations. So they uh. go into it and they're like, provided the person did what they said they were going to do and they had, you know, the right controls in place and the data looks okay and it didn't work, they're mm -hmm. still happy because they're like, they did what they said they're going to do. They did it quickly. They gave me, you know, a professional service versus at the moment, it's like I asked my friend in the lab next door, hey, can you like do this experiment for me? And they're like, oh, yeah, I'll do it later. And then it's like six months later, I'm like, I really need this experiment. And right. it's a very bad experience. Yeah, money and makes so, it real. Money makes a professional obligation, I think. Yeah. And so we've seen that actually people in general are much, much happier. Of course, it's the first thing you're going to do, yeah. Like this. And so there are few times where it really ends up being, you know, very difficult to resolve. So it's already global. It um, is, but it's mostly US based. Mostly US. So what's the global science scene like? Because, yep. again, Americans have this sort of, you know, we, we look at the world and think we're just on top of everything. Where's the most interesting stuff going on? Who has the most efficient market for actually doing discoveries and making progress because we're looking at Europe doing this, what, what is it, like a $5 billion or a $10 billion brain project yeah. I read about? And well, the brain initiative is, is yeah. also US funded. So Well, there's one in the US and is yeah. there one in Europe too that's yeah, trying to... Yeah, they have like Horizon 2020. They have yeah. a lot of really interesting projects. But they, um, so if you think about the science world, it's kind of divided in three. So okay. the US is kind of a third of the market. Europe is a third of the market. And then like Asia, Pacific, yeah. everyone else is, is the other third. And so... I think if you look at where the most important research being done is defined by high impact publications is yeah. still by far the US and the UK. Mm. Those two countries dominate, um, but other countries are rapidly catching up. So places like China, China is a research powerhouse. They produce really? a humongous amount of research. They're very well funded, but their research is funded usually by their government. The government, yep. not the corporations. They're not our corporations. Yeah, so very. this is very much like like the government spending on basic research. And they um, they publish, I think, an equal volume of research now as the rest of the world, but oh. it's usually in lower quality journals. So oh. it's as they catch up to sort of having access to all of the latest and greatest talent, mm -hmm. which they'll kind of import in, then they'll be able to really compete at the highest level of getting these nature and science and cell papers. So you think we're 10, 20 years from China being like sort of on par with the UK and the United Probably States? Probably not even 10 years. Five to 10? Yeah. Something in that range? Yeah. Now... The Chinese government has uh, major issues with corruption. Um, they kind of rig their economy, mm -hmm. counterfeits, no respect of IP. Mm -hmm. Should we trust research coming out of China? Should we trust research coming out of anywhere? That is well, actually okay, sure. a really good question. You got question. me there, for sure, yeah. So that's actually a project that we have worked on extensively, the Reproducibility Initiative. And this ah. project is to look at basically quality control for research that's being published. And a lot of the time it really um, is difficult to know of the research that's published what is really um, high-quality reproducible science. And pharmaceutical companies have released data showing that about 80% of the findings that they try and build upon that, that are published from academic groups, they cannot reproduce. What? Mm -hmm. 80%? Yeah. And so the reason for that is it's hard to reproduce or we have a large number of people who are maybe fudging the numbers to get <laughs> grants and get published? 
I mean, wow, what a delicate yeah, question, question for me to ask you since you're so entwined in the industry. But what would the candid answer be from somebody who's in the industry, not you? So I think that the real answer is that nobody knows because nobody mm. has done any studies on this. And so wow. our study that we are doing, we were funded by um, the Arnold Foundation to do a replication of the 50 most impa impactful cancer biology studies published from 2010 to 2012. So actually generate a replication data set. So these are many wow. thousands of experiments that are being conducted again by our network of expert labs. And, and you got funded for the, by Science Exchange. So Science Exchange was funded to do this wow. by the Arnold Foundation, yeah. What, what what does that cost to reproduce 50 experiments? That sounds like $100 million or something. It probably was about over $100 million of original research, but we wow. were, we our grant, because we can be so efficient and just repeat sure. the experiments, we got a grant of $1.3 million to do that work. Got it. So yeah. for 20K per, you can say, hey... I don't have to redo the whole lab no, and everything. No, we just do, yeah. Just that little piece yep. there where they said they sequenced this or they... Yep. this is the key finding. We're going to repeat that How far that through result. that are you? So we are like right in the middle of it right now, yeah. and it's it's super interesting. We're, we're learning a lot about some of the challenges of building on published research that are not about the researchers doing anything wrong in the original lab, but more about how difficult it is to obtain information once it's published. Ah. So basically... The recipe. Yeah, basically you publish this paper and then the person who did the work will move labs and or move countries and they'll mm. leave science and you will never be able to find them again and right. you won't have their full protocol of what they did. You won't have access to the materials they used and you won't be able to ask them any questions. You won't see the raw data. Wow. So all of these type of things, we're kind of building what would become what we consider the ideal version of a publication that actually somebody could build upon effectively. See, that's interesting. So by doing this 50 um, studies, yeah. studies, you're finding that people are not documenting the recipe properly. Yeah, they can't because the journals actually restrict how big a section you can use to describe your methods. Oh, God. So it's back to those goddamn <laughs> journals again. So a lot of not... them are working on this actively. So to be fair to them, they have initiatives around how can they sort of build protocol repository sites. And um, yeah, Have they heard of the internet? Yes, you, so there's, there's you, because a, you can print the web page longer than the number of print pages in the publication. Absolutely. It's, so um, one of our software engineers at Science Exchange built a side project called scientificprotocols.org. It's an mm -hmm. open source project to basically create a GitHub for scientific protocols. Right. Yeah, where people can upload it and they could just link out, they can version mm -hmm. control it, they can say, yeah, I used this basic protocol and modified it like this, and just bring some of the technologies that have been used in software to the scientific world. See, it's very interesting. By having this massive efficiency uh, in the exchange at Science Exchange, mm -hmm. it opens up all these really interesting applications of, oh, well, we have a platform that can do anything. It's in a way yep. you're like the Amazon Web Services cloud computing engine of the science space. People could just throw projects to it yep. and do big data or, or replicate yep. things, et cetera. Yeah, the um, replication in particular I think is really interesting because nobody wanted to do that before because it was so expensive. They were like, tedious. so boring. Like, who wants to replicate something? You know, it wanted, I want to focus on novel stuff. Where's the glory in that also? Exactly. Like, I got to think that these researchers have a little bit of ego. Right? Am I wrong? <laughs> no, you're not wrong. They want to be first, right? It's yeah. like a, it's like a nerd kind of ego. Yeah, though. absolutely. This is a weird group of people, or no? Like when they go to these like conferences and stuff like that. What's that like when you go to a conference and everybody's out at ten o'clock at night after dinner? Like, are they going out dancing and drinking? Is it crazy? Yes. <laughs> so I think um, it's kind of interesting because people assume that people who are successful in the academic science yeah. world are kind of super nerdy. That's what I'm getting. But at, actually, yeah. I think people who succeed are actually really good salespeople. So ah. they're very charismatic. They're very good presenters. They're very good writers. I agree with this. I have a really so a lot of those skill sets. I've always actually said I feel like a lot of the skill sets that make you successful in academia make you a good entrepreneur. Right, because they're constantly selling themselves and packaging themselves. Yeah. And they're a, thinking, how do I raise money? How do I present my data well? But even how do you build a successful startup? You do experiments. Mm. You design experiments. Lean you test. Startup, you yeah. iterate. It's like yeah. the whole way that you run your lab. Yeah. No, I'm friends with a couple of the physicists, like Lisa Randall. Yeah. And a couple of folks, and like yeah. They like to have a good time, and they're like yeah. normal people. They're yeah. not as like crazy no, nerdy as you might think. They're not. Yeah, they're, they actually they're very are. nice. A lot of them. All right, let me close with this. 
since you have so much insight into the space, if we just made you, you know, like the sort of president of the world, as it were, <laughs> and somebody just said, like, hey, here's ten billion dollars, deploy it as you would, um, as you best see fit, in order to solve the problems of humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I guess Science Exchange is your own little way of doing it with five million dollars in capital from yep. Union Square, et cetera. But now I'm saying, hey, let's do it with ten billion dollars. How would you deploy something like that to sort of make the world, you know? much faster at addressing these problems. Because again, there's inefficiencies. This is a decentralized, mm -hmm. fragmented market. If you could just spend $10 billion on the problem, what would you do and what would be the outcome, do you think? So I think, yeah, I always think deploying $10 billion is like very difficult. There's a lot, we've seen it with a lot of venture capital that it's hard sure. to deploy large sums of money effectively. So with that yeah. caveat, I, I think... Yeah. That's um, why it's a good question. Yeah. So I think that what I would do is I would love to see a lot more automation put in, into research labs. So we would basically have these cutting edge robots mm -hmm. and technologies and we would be able to stream all of the data that's produced, including the metadata associated with all experiments in real time into a cloud database and all of that data would be able wow. to be analyzed so that every experiment that was run was captured and all of the conditions around that experiment were captured and then you could start to mine that data at scale wow. you could also include it with um, in real time with all of the electronic medical records of real patients in hospital systems and oh, try and be wow. coordinating how you would deploy research experimental data what are we learning about that that experiment have it connected with the healthcare system so you can do these full cycles really rapidly. That, that's just off the top of your head. That's off the top Just like, you know, put on the spot. <laughs> Here's exactly the plan. That sounds so brilliant. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like, who are you? Where did you come from? Can we just make you president now? Like, mm -hmm. well, honestly, like, it, it does seem like with this platform, if you owned all the machines and you had a bunch of people who were the, if you just went and you hired the thousand most qualified people operating these machines, and you had all these machines in a central location, people could come and like just use it as a platform, and the price for using them for free was that your data had to be stored. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, how mind-blowing be awesome. that would yeah. be. And what could that cost? Okay, can you bring in Bill Gates, please? Because Bill Gates has $10 billion <laughs> here, and he wanted to just give it to somebody to do something interesting. And so give her her, you have the big oversized check with $10 million. <laughs> All right, listen, Elizabeth Irons, um, this has been amazing. I could sit here and talk to you for hours because oh, I don't know anything you. about this. And I'm like, I feel like I'm getting smarter just being in the same room with you. You're delightful. <laughs> wow. Who are you? Where did you come from? <laughs> this is incredible. Like, this is going to really, like, it's really interesting. I have to give uh, Paul Graham and because um, he was really, really interested, I think, in science, right? Like yeah. he really wanted to get more of that. And Sam Altman, because people give Y Combinator, I think, a lot of um, – um, they, they give them a hard time a little bit about the number of companies mm -hmm. and the Me Too companies and mobile companies. Of course, you do a lot of companies. You're going to have people doing the same things. But they really got onto the science thing and really tried to do interesting things of combining the lean startup methodology and the startup stuff that they really perfected at Y Combinator. And really, it feels like you're one of the first companies to come out of there and actually benefit from that. Like, Yeah, absolutely. It's really impressive. What about the company at Y Combinator I saw that's working on an HIV vaccine? And am I using the term vaccine? Because I don't know what term is correct. It's not a cure. That's it's correct, a vaccine. Yeah, yeah the they're, right term? they're working on a vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is that company? Oh, Immunity Project. Yeah, we got to get Immunity yeah. Project on here. So yeah. when I saw that, and by the way, I, I told this to Sam, if you do a demo day, and somebody's coming up to show like, oh, here's Tinder for this, and here's Uber <laughs> for that. When the guy gets up to say, I'm going to do the vaccine for HIV, you think we can give him more than 90 seconds? Maybe give him three <laughs> minutes, maybe give him 100, you know, give him 400 seconds or something like he might need a little more time. Just it's a wee hard. Bit. I mean, even I found with pitching Science Exchange for Demo Day, it's a complex space where there's not much necessarily expertise in the VC world around. Like, do oh. I, I mean, I remember when I pitched Y Combinator and actually Paul Graham said to me, do scientists get other scientists to do their experiments? That was a question he asked me. And I was like, yeah, of course. And I had to explain, yeah. this is how it happens. This is how research happens. People think that you're an individual researcher sitting in your lab by yourself right. doing all your research. And that's not how research is done. No, you're on a floor on a campus, on multiple it's massive. campuses. You're yeah. working with people all over the sure. world. And it's like... I say this is why Paul Graham is you know, really brilliant. Is he? He's not afraid to ask a stupid afraid, question like yeah. that and say, like, I don't know. So yeah. he's got no ego about it. So exactly. he's going to ask it and say, like, hey, educate me. He asks really good questions. And he's that's a smart how cat. he... I've learned to appreciate him over 
over the long yeah, term. Yeah, that's how he really helps you find the right path for your startup. And my God, did you get the all-star list of investors? I mean, Ron Conway, Andreessen Horowitz, Sam Altman, Union Square is the lead, Josh Schechter, a friend of mine, Yuri Milner, you got the Russians in there, everybody. <laughs> Um, and you've done a couple of rounds of financing now. Are you mm -hmm. going to get to break even with this current? Are you going to raise more money, you think? We're going to raise more money at the end of this year. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. Make sure I get a phone call. This is. <laughs> this seems like a really good idea. I mean, it's, it's going to be slow, though, right? It's this is slow. A... It's definitely, like I talked about, we've built that supply side, and now we're capitalizing on that through these large-scale pharmaceutical deals. So. Yeah. It's really hard to build marketplaces because mm -hmm. you have to, like Airbnb, like yep. get both sides of the market, yep. Yelp, both sides of the market. But it's becoming a bit of a science now. Like, yeah. you, you know your acquisition cost to get yep. each of the schools on yep. cost you, what, like a couple hundred bucks? to get a school on or something. Yeah, and so we, we definitely are looking at how, you know, all of those things fall into the growth strategy and as we expand into mm -hmm. Europe, what are the costs there, all yeah. of those types of things. Amazing. Uh, so everybody check out Science Exchange. Follow Elizabeth Irons on um, Twitter, I-O-R-N-S, and um, scienceexchange.com. And what was the, the project you're doing on the side that you were talking the about? The Reproducibility Initiative. How do people find that? They, they just can do just a, Google Reproducibility just, Initiative. There you go, which is amazing. And um, all right, hey, and uh, thanks to the sponsors and uh, Miami award-winning producer Jackie. She hates when I say that. I just say it all the time. She, I, you know, four Emmys, really, and she's producing this show. I mean, that's why we're getting great guests now. <laughs> Like she's like, I got a great guest for you. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll just show up and I'll talk to somebody smart. Really, Jackie, you're amazing. Um, and Jacob, you too, you're super amazing. Thanks for being a great director and having flawless AV. Thanks to the sponsors. Thanks to WeWork. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.